You would have to be a dog in order to really know what a dog is thinking. For some years, researchers have been using MRI scan in their laboratories to understand the mechanics of the human reward system. MRI. Magnetic resonance imaging makes use of powerful radio waves and magnetic fields to produce detailed images of the tissues and organs in the body. Although Gregory Burns had grown up with dogs, he only got one when he completed medical school. He had been married for five years to cat and kids weren't in their plans yet. After surviving the gruesome hundred-hour weeks, they got a pug, Newton. Though he got some other dogs, Newton was still the king of their hearts. The kids, Helen and Maddie came along and bonded with the dogs. At the age of 15, Newton's health deteriorated and it was time for him to go. With a snort, he was laid to rest but his spirit never left Gregory Burns. One question kept lingering on Gregory Burns' mind. Did Newton ever love him back? He was curious to know what his dogs were really thinking. A few months after Newton's death, Cat Burns and the kids went back to the animal shelter to adopt another dog, Calypso aka Callie. Dogs and humans belong together. We couldn't exist without each other. Tilda Gregory Burns. Many authors have attempted to answer the questions about a dog's mind but most are based on two flawed assumptions. 1. The human tendency to anthropomorphize, we tend to project our personal feelings and thoughts on other things. In human-to-human interaction, mentalizing is a critical skill because humans maintain a mental models of each other. We are constantly guessing what's on other people's minds. 2. Relying on wolf behavior to interpret dog behavior. This is known as lupomorphism. Wolves and dogs do have a common ancestor but dogs did not descend from wolves. So what can we do to better know a dog's mind? There is actually an old metaphysical debate on the question of what a dog is thinking. As humans, our whole experience happens mainly inside our heads. It's through the activity of our brains that we are able to see a rainbow or shooting star. Similar events occur in a dog's brain, but they react differently. When a dog barks on seeing food, we think the dog wants food. That same dog might bark in front of a TV but we can only wonder if that means the TV is too loud or fun for the dog. Dogs can't talk, and we can't transport ourselves into a dog's mind to know what its subjective experience is. Tilda Gregory Burns. If we knew that dogs could reciprocate feelings in dog-human relationships, everything would change. It could mean that dog-human relationships are just like human-human relationships. Read on to find out the whole truth about the relationships between Gregory Burns and his dogs. Do they love him as much as he loves them? Her state of alertness never went off. Even when she is lying in bed while trying to sleep. Callie was nothing like Newton. First, she was chosen because of her muscular and lean body, which is way different than that of pugs like Newton. Her head was similar to a periscope because she was constantly on the lookout for prey. Despite her friendliness, most dogs in the neighborhood avoided her because of her posture. At an early age, it is pretty easy to note the differences in the behavior of dogs based on their breed and their nurture. To make matters worse, Callie usually killed chipmunks and she also avoided body contact with anyone in the home. When it was time for bed, she would readily sit at the foot of the bed and watch out for potential intruders. Gregory Burns couldn't stop thinking about the great difference between Callie and his other dogs, especially Newton. Before long, Callie got signed up for a basic obedience class at the dog training facility, Comprehensive Pet Therapy, CPT. A long time ago, a Russian physiologist known as Ivan Pavlov did a study on dog's digestive system and his findings, which seemed negative to him, led to the discovery of classical conditioning. For instance, the presence of food usually makes hungry dogs salivate but Ivan Pavlov discovered that a neutral stimulus, e.g. a ringing bell before the food appears can make the dog salivate. Classical conditioning. Dogs have reflexive responses that are not natural. Though classical conditioning is powerful, it cannot be used to train a dog. Instead, operant conditioning, i.e. instrumental learning, is used to train animals to carry out purposeful behavior. For instance, a hand signal is used to tell a dog to sit and when the dog does, he is rewarded. Going into an MRI is not a natural dog behavior but Gregory Burns and the dog trainer, Mark, had to teach a natural sequence of reactions to Cali. For example, Down stay, a position in which the dog lies down and stays put. For the dog project to be a success in spite of the MRI noise, Gregory Burns had to use some criteria to select the ideal dogs for the study. 
The dog had to be social, cool with strangers, free of noise phobia, and full of motivational drive. Callie didn't meet all these criteria, so the search was on. The challenge with MRI is that the test animal had to remain perfectly still and this usually meant using medications to sedate the animal. The MRI scanner is loud and might make a person feel claustrophobic, not to talk of a dog with super sensitive hearing. On the other hand, sedation was not an option because once administered, it changes most of the brain's functions. The dogs had to be wide awake so that their brain image could be captured and studied for the dog project. The sense of hearing of dogs is four times as sensitive as that of humans. In the early stage of the project, everyone in the lab was focused on the big question i.e. finding out about the events in a dog's brain. They were so captivated that they didn't make adequate arrangements for the practical aspects like the type and location of a brain scanner. It is expensive and hard to get booking for several hours on an MRI scanner, which is a limited, high-end clinical instrument. Soon enough, Gregory Burns and his team found Yerkes National Primate Research Center, which had a facility for MRI scanning. The director of the center, Leonard Howell, invited them to look at the scanning of monkeys' brains. There were training boxes that housed a sterile interior and a cubby for wires and tubes for monitoring equipment. During an examination, each monkey is held down by a collar on its neck that fits into the restraining device. Then the monkey's head is usually immobilized in a soft cast. To make the operations run smoothly, the behavior of the monkeys were shaped via rewards. Leonard Howell's research group had a focus, biology of drug addiction. The monkeys were used as test subjects because it was unethical to use humans for such projects. Gregory Burns and his team had seen enough to know that the center was not appropriate for the dog project. The center was not enthusiastic about the project either. The road to scientific progress in biomedical science is littered with the bodies of many animals as well as humans. Nazis were the first ones to start experimenting with humans. As a result, harmful experiments were done on the people held in concentration camps, with a silly justification of progress in science. Due to those horrific experiments, a code of conduct was established on the right process for doing medical research. So for brain imaging experiments, a panel usually reviews all the procedures. The Nuremberg Code of 1947 came into existence because of the dangerous and harmful research studies done on humans by the Nazi doctors in concentration camps. But, how will things differ with the dog project? Though there are principles in place for human research, the law does not classify animals with the same rights as humans. Animals are just seen as property and researchers can choose to do as they like. In 1966, the Animal Welfare Act was signed into law. According to the Act, any entity that carries out experiments on animals i.e. universities, needs to have a committee that reviews and approves research protocols. Universities are seen as research facilities and they need to abide by federal rules and regulations in order to continue receiving grants from the federal government. To kick-start the dog project, Gregory Burns, and his team prepared a protocol document and sent it to the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, IACUC. A week later, a lawyer called to deliver the bad news, they can't approve the project due to liabilities. It didn't take long before the researchers realized that the rules governing studies on children offered the best model for the dog project. Just like children, dogs are not able to make informed decisions and give consent. The IACUC was happy with the updated proposal that has resolved the ethics issues. After this, the other administrative hurdles were cleared and the lawyers signed off the dog project. The clicker gives instantaneous feedback that makes it obvious to the dog that he has done something correctly and will get a treat. Callie was the first test subject and she had to undergo a bit of conditioning. Mark had to train Callie. First up. Mark clicked and rewarded Callie to enable her to establish the relationship between a click and reward transfer. A dozen clicks later, Callie understood the concept. Clicker training is used to tell dogs that they are doing something right. Since, it's hard to replicate the same click all the time, use clicker. Next, Mark had to shape her behavior. When Callie does an action close to the desired behavior, the clicker makes it clear that she had done the correct thing. Then, she gets a reward. Slowly, Mark lured Callie into the head coil with the clicker and hot dog reward. With every click reward, Mark placed the hot dog further into the head coil until Callie was lying down in a sphinx position in the coil. A new subject soon joined Callie. 
Melissa Kate usually takes part in agility classes with her dog, Mackenzie. She decided to volunteer in the dog project when Mark told her about it. With treats in hand, Melissa easily coaxed Mackenzie to lie down in the head coil. Even when she backed away, Mackenzie didn't move from the position. Then, a surprising event happened. While Mackenzie was lying still in the head coil, Callie watched her slowly and showed that dogs learn from each other. Imitation, also known as social learning, is a clear human behavior but strangely, dogs haven't received much credit for doing so too. For some weeks, Callie went through more training with the head coil. The goal was to stay consistent with short, daily training. The tasks were then made complex with the addition of elements before the final behavior. Steps, chin rest, and mock noise were added to the head coil to fully shape complex behaviors in dogs. How will dogs react to a living machine that uses circulation pumps to beats and a compressor to breathe? With the rapid progress in training, Callie and Mackenzie were almost ready for the MRI. Their first encounter with the living machine had to be good and pleasant. If not, the weeks of training and conditioning would go to waste. The first problem was the noise. Such loud noises are known to cause hearing loss in dogs, but earmuffs can be used to minimize that risk during the dog project. The dogs had to get used to the entire experience in the scanner environment. This reduced the risk of them panicking and running wild. MRI makes loud noises that can get as high as 100 decibels. The same decibels as a jackhammer. The second problem was ghosting. Meanwhile, dogs have a tendency of placing their heads in different positions in the head coil. A slight movement of the dog's head during MRI scan causes ghosting and can mess up the results. The solution was to find something to hold the dog's head in a place like the chin rest at the back and sides. One day, an idea came to Gregory Burns to use a broken boogie board as a sort of 3D cradle that provided secure support i.e. up, down, front, and back. Callie didn't mind it one bit as the cradle was fitted on her neck. The new chin rest was the new solution for the motion problem. Due to some missing or distorted landmarks, a dog's brain looked nothing like a human's brain. All the training and preparations led up to this day, the dog day. To get started, the dogs were allowed to run around the lab in order to burn off nervous energy. Since a little tiredness will help them to stay still in the MRI. To study the human brain, the scan is normally done in blocks of 10 minutes. This time dropped to 5 minutes since dogs can't stay engaged for that long. With the earmuffs over her head, Callie scooted into the head coil and was ready to go. Everything was fine until the scanner's shimming noise freaked out Callie. She ran out but she got back into the MRI after some tries. Before long, images of Callie's brain and spinal cord showed up on the scanner console and everyone was ecstatic in the lab. Even though they had to adjust the location settings, 60 functional scans were eventually captured, surpassing the goal of 10 functional images. The run was also done on Mackenzie and Dog Day was over. Since the resulting images showed that a human's brain differs immensely from a dog's brain, the researchers were not sure about how much human neuroscience literature that they could use. From the experiments that they just did, they were able to control visual channels with hand signals as well as the taste and smell with peas and hot dogs given to the dogs. With three more trips to the MRI, the first phases of the dog project were completed. In a dog's brain, The most noticeable part is the olfactory lobe, which makes a dog's sense of smell 100,000 times as sensitive as that of a human. A smell experiment was also done to better understand the mental world of dogs and it showed that the smell of a familiar human activates the inferior temporal lobe. Dogs do remember the important people in their lives even when those people aren't present. Conclusion Throughout the world, dogs and cats are the two most popular pets that descended from predatory species. So, when the dog project began, it was all about scanning a dog's brain to better understand their feelings for humans. Was the dog-human relationship one-sided? For the first time ever, Gregory Burns and his team found direct evidence of reciprocation in the dog-human relationship and social cognition in the canine brain. In answer to the question, what are dogs thinking? The big conclusion was that, they are thinking about what we are thinking. Dogs truly are man's best friend. Try this. If you have a dog that can't sit still or follow your instructions, use a clicker that gives instantaneous feedback and reward system to train your dog. It is best to spend time with your dog so that he, she can create a mental image of you.
Avoid wearing a lot of perfumes to allow your dog to know your natural scent. 